Hi, and welcome to my video on units and dimensional analysis. The first half of the video covers the basics of the topic, uh, while the second half of the video talks about the more interesting topic of natural units in special relativity and quantum mechanics, which is a little bit more abstract, slightly more difficult, but should be okay. Uh, finally, we finish with a brief discussion of the LHC as the world's most powerful microscope. Hmm, intriguing. So here it is, units and dimensional analysis. Most of the measurements we make come with dimensions, like length or time, and these are measured with units. One of the most important basic skills to learn is how to convert between different units. Let's take a unit conversion example from chemistry and see how many moles are in 800 milligrams of oxygen. To do a unit conversion, we start by writing down the quantity we're starting with, in this case 800 milligrams and then multiply it by several factors which are all equal to 1. For example, to convert from milligrams to grams, we would write, we would multiply by 1 gram divided by 1,000 milligrams. Because 1 gram equals 1,000 milligrams, this factor is equal to 1. For oxygen, there are 16 grams in every mole. A mole is some number of molecules, and the molecular weight of oxygen is 16, so there are 16 grams in each mole. So, one mole divided by 16 grams equals one for oxygen. Now, we can treat the units as if they were fractions and start canceling them out. So, milligrams in the numerator cancels with milligrams in the denominator, and grams cancels with grams. After we do that, we multiply what's left, uh, just like multiplying fractions, and get the final, our final answer of 0 0.05 moles, or one twentieth of a mole of oxygen. It's a very simple procedure and all unit conversions work this way. Dimensional analysis means using your knowledge of units to analyze an equation. Here's an example to show you what I mean. One of the formulas that people tend to remember is that kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So let's use dimensional analysis to analyze this formula. On the left hand side are units of energy. On the right hand side, we have units of mass times units of velocity squared. So we know that units of energy is the same as units of mass times units of velocity squared. Since velocity is the same as length over time, we know that this must also be equal to mass times length squared divided by time squared. Acceleration is length over time squared, so this is also the same as mass times acceleration times length. And since mass times acceleration is force, this has the same units as force times length. Staring at these unit equivalences might remind you of several formulas involving energy. For example, this middle one uh, might remind you that one joule is the same as one kilogram meter squared per second squared, the joule being the SI unit of energy, and this equation is its definition. The fact that energy is the same as mass times acceleration times length reminds us of the formula for gravitational potential energy, U equals mgh, mass times gravitational acceleration times height. Finally, the last equation reminds us of work equals force times distance, work being a form of energy. Any sensible equation will follow certain rules of dimensional analysis. It's important to verify that your own work follows these rules to avoid making certain mistakes. For example, would you ever write the equation $7 equals 8 miles? That's completely ridiculous and obviously wrong. Similarly, you should never write an equation like 1 half mv squared, which we know is energy, equals distance times time, which is not the same as energy. Even though these are variables versus actual numbers, it makes no sense in the same way that $7 equals 8 miles makes no sense. The second rule of dimensional analysis is very similar to the first rule. Just like dimensions have to match on both sides of an equal sign, whenever you add two quantities together, they must have the same dimension. For example, adding together distance and time, that doesn't make any sense. 3 seconds plus 4 meters doesn't mean anything. The third rule 
is that the arguments of special functions should be dimensionless. Special functions means e to the x or sine of x or anything like that. And when you have a function like this, x must be dimensionless. And there's a very simple reason. If we expand e to the x, we know that that's the same as 1 plus x plus 1 half x squared plus etc. There's an infinite series there. And if x were not dimensionless, e to the x would be the same as adding together a bunch of terms which had different dimensions. Now that we've mastered the basics of dimensional analysis, we're ready for something a little more advanced, namely the concept of natural units. The first example is with relativity and the speed of light. When you see a car driving down the road, it will appear to be moving at a different speed depending on whether you're on the side of the road or driving along next to it. Einstein taught us that with light, everyone always measures it to be moving at the same speed, namely 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Now we're ready to take a big conceptual leap and set the speed of light equal to 1. This should be thought of as the same as setting 1,000 milligrams per gram equal to 1. In other words, it's just a unit conversion factor. But this time, it's a conversion between di units of distance and units of time. The lesson we learn from special relativity is that measuring length and time in different units is just as unnatural as measuring some masses in milligrams and others in grams. There's another dimensionful constant of nature that shows up in quantum mechanics, and that's Planck's constant, h-bar. h-bar has units of energy times time, and thus gives us a way to convert between units of energy and units of frequency, or inverse time, in the same way that the speed of light lets us convert units of length into units of time. I'll leave it to you to check that saying energy is the same as inverse time is equivalent to saying that momentum is the same as inverse length. This form of the equivalence is embodied by the famous de Broglie formula for the wavelength of a particle, which says that the wavelength is equal to 2 pi times h bar divided by the momentum. This equation is at the heart of what is called wave-particle duality and in natural units just looks like wavelength equals 2 pi divided by momentum. We can use this equation to understand the incredible resolution of an electron microscope, which also provides us with a nice exercise in unit conversion. The kinetic energy of electrons in an electron microscope is something like 300 keV, kiloelectron volts. And we know that the kinetic energy formula is that this is p squared over 2m, momentum squared over twice the mass. The mass of an electron is about 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. If you do the algebra to figure out the momentum, you'll find a very small momentum if measured in normal everyday units. Once we know the momentum, we can find the wavelength using the de Broglie formula. The wavelength of the electrons in the electron microscope represents the size of the smallest possible object you can see using the microscope. And once you plug in all the numbers and convert the units properly, which is an exercise I recommend you do, you find a very, very small number, about 2 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. This is just a theoretical limit, and in practice, the best electron microscopes can only see objects that are 25 or 50 times bigger. But even that is 10,000 times better than you could ever do with visible light. As a final application, we set both h bar and c equal to 1, which in a relativistic quantum mechanical setting allows us to convert energy, length, and time into each other. There aren't many situations in which this is useful, but one example is inside of a particle accelerator, where we can convert the collision energy into a length scale thus facilitating an interpretation of the particle accelerator as a gigantic microscope. Performing the relevant calculation for the 14 TeV center of mass collision energy that the LHC is sp supposed to produce by taking 1 over the energy and multiplying it by h bar c, which of course we've set equal to 1, we find that the length scale is incredibly small, 1.4 
times 10 to the minus 20 meters. This is such a small length that it's hard to get a good idea of just how small it is. For example, if you took the ratio of the distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is about 93 million miles, to the size of an atom, which is about the resolution of an electron microscope, this is the same as the ratio between the length of your living room and the LHC resolution size. That means if you shrank the distance between the Earth and the Sun down to living room size and shrank atoms by that same amount, the resulting size of the atoms would be the LHC resolution size. Well, that's all I have to say about units and dimensional analysis. Stay tuned for more.